without further ado, I would love to welcome uh, on stage Kaushik Mukherjee. He is the COO and co-founder of Sugar Cosmetics. Uh, for those of you who don't know Sugar, um, Sugar Cosmetics is, is a great example of how a brand can build an engaged customer base and grow rapidly through, through the D2C channel. And joining him as the moderator will be Yashwant Reddy. He is the chief business officer for Mo Engage uh, for Europe and Asia regions. So welcome Kaushik and welcome Yashwant. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, I'll let you take over the, take over the screen. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Ashwin. Hi, Yash. Hey, Kaushik. How's it going this morning? Fantastic. Quick check. Are we good to go, or should we just give it another minute, Sandeep? Yeah, we, we should go ahead. Yeah, we should start now. Awesome. Thank, uh, thanks for joining us this morning, Kaushik. It's, it's our privilege to host you this morning. Let's, uh, let's get started right away, I guess. Uh, you know, just what. Take us back a couple of years, probably back in 2013, 2014, even when D2C was yet to break out as a theme. What what was going on in your mind when you start when you sort of uh, started thinking about launching a brand like Sugar? Uh, just walk us through that journey once. Sure, sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Yash. I'll just quickly zoom out and maybe recap uh, what 2015 looked like. And to everybody who's attending this morning, I'd just say. Uh, you know, over the lockdown, I've picked up a very interesting skill. I can speak uh, while reading chat windows parallelly. So if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, type it in. I'll try to pick them up as we go ahead. Um, so, you know, yes, I have my answer to this question has actually changed over a period of time. But the honest answer is, if you ask me, Sugar Cosmetics back in 20, late 2015 was launched because A, we thought the market needed um, better products. B, we thought there was a target segment which was underserved. There is a C which says because the company needed to survive and uh, D is all of the above. The, actually, the truth is actually all of the above because today I think D2C entrepreneurs start off with a very, um, you know, they know what to look for. They're like, okay, I want to build in this space. I think I know how to create. Let's take, let's take an unrelated category. Let's take chocolates, for example. I was speaking to somebody who's creating artisan chocolates. I know how to create artisan chocolates which can be shipped via Blue Dot FedEx, which do have a shelf life of say maybe, you know, even uh, one month after opening. So they know how to do it. But finding the white space is something which people do very deliberately today. For us, it was a bit uh, luck by chance. We, our company started in 2012. Uh, for the first three years, we were in a different business. We were in a beauty subscription business. And the one thing which we uh, kept realizing was that when we used to ship products of other brands, we used to ship beauty products and personal care products of different categories. There'd be, there'd be cosmetic makeup, there'd be skincare, hair care, um, fragrance, if you will. But nothing seemed to delight the consumers and get engagement as much as uh, makeup. And, and makeup is a smaller market than skincare, right? But what was interesting was when we realized that why is it that maximum engagement used to come from uh, makeup? It was because makeup as a category is designed for digital because I mean, look, it's skincare at the end of it. I can show you the tube. I can show you the packaging, but when I squeeze it out, it's going to be either off white or plain white, some, something. I mean, and, and, you know, in an era where, you know, you need fast social validation and likes, nobody waits for two weeks of a regime to do before and after it's, it's tougher. It's getting easier now, but uh, makeup was played very beautifully to the digital category. And um, we were lucky that there was a behemoth, at that time, Nika, who decided to build the category as well. And uh, so we got some wind in our sales. And that helped us start off um, as, a, as a D2C competitor. Today, of course, we are more digital first than D2C. But the first two years, I mean, we were mostly uh, selling a lot on our own website. And that's how, that's how it started. That's how the genesis was. Awesome. And, and how did you sort of go about identifying these initial customer segments, which, which probably would work for you? I, I, you know, uh, you mentioned a couple of iterations and all of that, but walk us through that journey of identifying what's that core segment that you wanted to sell to at a high level. So one of the price cuts we took, one of the, sorry, one of the, you know, axes we took was the pricing. And, you know, back in 2015, if you look at the, uh, let's say average price point of a red lipstick, you'd find that there were a lot of players in the 250 to 350 ish price point, say 399, if you will. Our understanding was that a lot of early adopters who wanted to spend more on something new 
you know correlated to that would be you know their impression was that it would be better there was a massive leap for them to cover because when they wanted to spend more than 400 rupees on a red lipstick these are 2015 prices not today's prices the next lipstick was at you know 990 that was l'oreal and there was a mac at 1450 so that was interesting it seemed like there was a little bit of a white space at that time and we felt that as a brand we could start off by launching a product at the eight dollar price range say say about about 600 bucks price range the only thing is we thought we were the only ones who discovered that white space i mean that's not true i mean there is no long-term advantage where data flows so freely so eventually um, i know that lacme launched lacme absolute which is much higher i know that some other brands gravitated upwards but we didn't know all of that then that would happen so we just uh, decided okay let's launch uh, sugar as a brand with a you know average price point of 600 rupees and the challenge we had over there was that and um, you know in in this market especially if you're d2c online uh, there are many levers which you can use for growth discounting is a big lever you can use for growth unfortunately you know we've always been very paranoid about using discounts and we've never been able to use discounts because the the fear in our mind is that you know okay if i'm operating at 600 and if i discount it and land up at the price range of the much larger brands who have celebrity face atl print they, how do I compete? I can't compete with them, right? So the only way to say that, you know, do not, I mean, we can't break that price point, but we can, we have to somehow convince the customer that, you know, it's worth paying that much for it, which could mean additional gifts with purchases or, or you know, building a narrative around it. So, so that was, these are some of the challenges, but, but, you know, that price point is, that, that's how we identified the price point. The other axis we took was when we looked at our audience, we felt that at one end of the audience, there was, you know, the, the 18 to 21 year old, um, let's say Maybelline's customer. I mean, very, very precious customer. And they would be, you know, all the packaging, targeting, communication around uh, everything towards this audience was more young, fun, you know, colorful, poppy. And at the absolute other end of the spectrum, there was uh, brands that were very sophisticated, very luxurious. I mean, you know, with the Bobby Browns and everything else. Yeah. You know, our only, our only uh, understanding or our only takeaway was that there was a third audience set that was emerging and it's a niche and the, see you know what the beauty about a niche is the beauty about niche is that the big players don't have the time and should not have the time i guess to focus on niche but if as a d2c brand you take a bet that today's niche in five years is going to be a sizable market yeah. building that niche starts from today so that's what we did i think we found a third bucket of audience who was they they weren't swayed by the you know, legacy advertisements, which got a celebrity to pick up a product and said, you know, hey, ye, you know, the classic, uh, ye mera son der raaz, you know, I mean, uh, they just wanted to learn from peer. They wanted to do their own research. They were opinion leaders themselves. Very, very small in number. But over the last five years, we've seen the number scale. Of course, influencers, being an influencer is a legit career choice right now. So uh, we were fortunate to hop onto the bandwagon way early. And they that played a part in uh, spreading um the word about sugar, not so much as an anti-establishment brand, but different, not a brand which used the traditional uh, marketing methods to scale and build awareness. Awesome. And I know you launched with a very small set of products to begin with, but something very interesting I noticed yeah. was you, you got down to the extent of almost giving your own colors, a uh, color name, something like a violet bullet. Is <laughs> If I search oh. that... <laughs> oh, yes. Somebody noticed. <laughs> And that's a great SEO tactic as well, right? Like if I search Violet Bullet today, the first 20 results on Google are just pointing back to sugar. Was, was that by choice? Or yeah. <laughs> tell us more about that. Yes, yes. I, I, I would love to say that, you know, this was a very Jugadu hack SEO that the team and us pulled <laughs> off. But uh, nee, actually, when we started creating it, it, it was just, you know, uh, uh, okay, you know what? When you're starting from scratch, uh, there are very few rules that you feel are imposed on you. As the business scales, then you realize that this compliance, hai, wo rule, hai, ye, you're going to fit in with some retail norm. So we were starting from a blank slate. And I remember there was this, uh, we did our research and said the first product we want to launch is a, uh, no surprises, Black Kajal, the most popular SQ in the country. <laughs> but we said, okay, and, and we want to name in something fun. And it was unanimous. I mean, like, you know, there's, there's a song, uh, you know, Elvis, Elvis song called Twist and Shout. I'm like, you know, I mean, this is the kajal which you twist and, it, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it was a twist of format and the pigmentation was so deep, you know, it, it was it was loud. So I'm like, you know, there can be no other name. This has to be called Twist and Shout. So, and, and you know, that started almost like a fun activity with any range we launch, whether it be 
like i'll tell you one of our um, products which launched in december 2015 it's still on our you know one of the sqs is still in our top 10 sqs and now we have scaled to about 450 plus sqs is a, a matte crayon lipstick and there was this phrase that i mean i, I was mad as hell you know to hear that Th- that range is called matte as hell <laughs> it's you know, all of our ranges i mean i don't know um, i i think very few people spend time to actually read that and notice that but it gives us in the entire team a lot of joy and yeah now that you mention it if people search for violet bullet if people search for skull to our tan fan one of our um, the popular shades um, i mean there's a there's a shade of kajal pearl with a deep blue it's called rodas blues it's uh, people do our, our products do end bubbling up so yeah if you're late to the party i think maybe these sort of seo tactics do help but yes we do on about you know half of our um, d2c traffic and half of our d2c sales is uh, organic plus direct so i think that helps that's awesome it's great to see the attention of detail that has gone into sort of you know stand out in the obviously a category which will obviously get crowded over a period of time right and that's great to see but as you started scaling up koshik uh, when did you start thinking about your own website and you know your own platform to sort of sell it was it right from the beginning and if i am a d2c brand which is launching today how should i be thinking about this entire own brand website and all of that so i want to i i don't i, I was having this debate with somebody else so i want to set something straight the website you know when we were growing up so 10 years back website seemed like a task right i mean website banana oh my god where do you get a developer from who's not going to fleece me and deliver junk i mean i mean delivers are amazing i think half the times we don't give scope properly i mean scope it out properly right but it's become so simple right now with no code low code options i mean i i know that um, the our first website when we when we launched we actually didn't have a coding team it was we used shopify so it was almost like setting up a blog and it started so i mean if i were to do it all over again i would say when you start selling the day you are you're ready to tell the world that hey i'm i'm sugar or i'm some other brand what are they going to do they are, they're going to listen to you for 2 seconds maybe 30 seconds nobody wants to listen to too much from a person who they don't know or trust right they're going to listen to you for maybe 20 seconds and tune out but if they hear you again by somebody else eventually they will come and search for you now when they search for you they have to stumble upon some material right and what better material could be there online um than your website i mean you could say instagram but when you start up instagram is going to have very little followers right so in fact it's going to work the other way wherein they're going to feel like oh this is a bahut naya brand hai. maybe you can't trust it i think website is, is a fascinating starting point to tell your story i remember uh, another brand in our space m kafin uh, tarun you know he has a very interesting take on this he's like you know partner channels you know all the amazon nike that's where you go to sell uh, you know uh, but but our our platform is where we tell our story i mean we 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 control the narrative we walk people through why the why and you know why this is a better product why you should pay so much for the product i think that helps and and it has become so simple i mean i am not a developer i can create a website so i'm sure all the attendees on this call if you you know you can it's it's like creating a blog right so my my suggestion would be day one you should have your website set up no matter how basic it is even if it is a one page one page uh, landing page you know so to say but uh, i think that i think that's important got it and it always comes down to as a trade off between distribution on one hand versus you know uh, being able to control the customer experience and understanding the customer behavior in a better fashion right um, so on after you know scaling up your own website and apps and all of that how did that help you sort of better understand this whole thing and what are some of the things that weigh in uh, in your mind when you're thinking about like say partner portals versus this specifically from a customer experience standpoint and a consumer behavior standpoint so you know i think partner portals is a no brainer everybody has to do it you have to do it and you know i i don't know if i have said this earlier i don't know if this will be a repeat for some of you in the audience but i'll tell this again right i mean the point is imagine you have set up your house your website and you are ready to throw the best party in town why should people attend your party they don't know that you throw best good party in town you are a fun person to party with so you have to go to other parties in town which is the amazon which is the nike which is the mintra and flipkarts because that's where all the party is that's where all the action is that's where all the audience is once you go there and people uh, try your product party with you realize that okay you know what these guys are great great pricing great product then they will agree to come to your own party in your own house so i th- i think partner portals are invaluable uh, you know in terms of uh, initially you know 
letting the you know let the rubber hit the road because when you create a product who are you going to ask you're going to ask your friends family that hey you know kaisa hai and look nobody's honest they are all going to be like uh you know let's 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 be let's empathize let's say yeah yeah bahut acha hai no no the, the truth is <laughs> nike and amazon reviews nike by by and large the audience is still more uh, benevolent Amazon reviews can be brutal. Okay, <laughs> so uh, you have to sell over there to see that what are, what are people actually actually saying and uh, iterate fast. Because see, uh, my my stand is you one, once you do partner portal, once you sell enough on partner portal, people will uh, engage with you on other platforms like Instagram, YouTube, and over there, if you are selling a story, you know, sharing your story, saying that you know this is what we this is what's next. Come and see more details on our own website. eventually people do land up on your own website but having said that there will always have to be a balance i don't think that it is you know i don't think partner portal is a funnel wherein you get the customer a lot of people think that partner portal when i get the customer then you know chupke se i switch the customer to our own website no partner portal that's not what partner portal is for partner portal is i mean they what partner portal are like like what 50, 50 times your size right so you have to i mean they have to be a treated with enough <laughs> respect care and you know they will form a equal part of your channel like today uh so our business as of today is pretty evenly split half of it comes from offline half from online today not when we started and in the online part it's almost a 50 50 split 50% comes from own website and the remaining um 50 comes from all the other partner channels so so i think we have to do partner channels they uh, in the funnel i mean there are many funnels but if i build the, talk about the most simplistic funnel like right, the whole awareness interest desire and action right so we are solving for awareness right now how do you solve for awareness if you are not there where people are actually searching for products in your category so that's the reason why you have to you know play the amazon nike mintra flipkart game really hard and give it some time and eventually people will realize that hey you know these guys are great let's follow them on instagram let's visit their website and yeah some of them will end up purchasing from your own website also although that i you know i don't think that should be objective but uh, people do there's a lot of organic traffic that comes suppose yes i find you on amazon if you're delighted chances are very high that you will influence at least two three other people around you to check us out yeah. those people may not go back to amazon they may directly search for us on instagram and google and uh, you know that's why i think our organic traffic has scaled over a period of time absolutely got it and that's a great point you made about the entire awareness journey so let's say people are now aware of your brand people have started purchasing your product uh what's your thoughts on retention post that when do you start investing in internal crm growth team how did you go about that journey on the whole so if the question is when we should do answer is day one if your question is when did we do oh my god we were late <laughs> and that is the reason why i think we should do it day, day one no no i'll be honest i mean i can be honest i mean the thing is customer acquisition is so hard yeah. it is so hard it is hard because you know there is a standard pattern customer acquisition follows you start off with some basic ads on instagram facebook google and initially the cac you get is like decent Yeah. and it should be decent because you're you're skimming people who already have a latent interest in your brand yeah. or who already are people who uh, are early adopters and you feel that wow i've cracked it i'm going to just 100x my spends and my revenues are going to 100x i mean you will be so disappointed once the cac shoots up to 3 4 5x of what you initially uh, got and i think i think the way to offset that is to start nurturing your customers from day one and and what we have now started doing is when you have a very large audience pool we have to uh, all brands at some point in time have to move out of the mindset of single communication to everybody like when we started we used i, I mean i was discussing this with you we used tools like mailchimp sms gupshop and you know just to send the same message to you know say say half a million people yeah. beyond a point that hurts your especially your loyal customers because it becomes a blind spot for yeah. them but if you invest i mean now we 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 have our own crm but uh, it's been just about a year so i think i think we started very late we should have done it at least 2 years earlier but if you invest in a crm to talk to people on a one on one basis you control some user journeys suppose i mean you can do so many fine things which are very strategic in nature suppose you know somebody who has visited a product page more than twice so what so many people visit a product more than twice you can't start giving a benefit to everybody but in that subset there are 20% of the people who are heavy spenders who already spent say more than 5000 rupees in a year on you i mean that's an opportunity to delight i mean it is impossible to do all these on excel 
uh, or mailchimp and forget about it you won't have time i mean yeah. there are so many things so the the best thing i think which we have done and which you know a lot of those who are hearing can do is if you if you have someone who's smart who loves tinkering around with software analyst maybe a you know b school grad or not even b school grad but somebody who gets software how to use it i mean you can be so creative with this i think that that's why if you ask me the time to website day one crm fine crm maybe if you if you uh, i understand it's an expense and that's probably the reason why we also pushed it out by a bit but once you find product market fit that okay there are people who i don't know who are not related to me they are also willing to pay for my product i think that's the time to start investing in a, a crm and and i have been pleasantly surprised how supportive uh, a lot of crm uh, you know teams are towards startups i mean there are people who give one year worth of uh, you know free benefits and credits three months worth of student credits and just to get started i i we we miss that bus but for those starting today i would say st- start your website list on partner portals ch- start your website list on partner portal channel start selling you will get feedback you will have to iterate i don't think i don't know i i don't i don't know many people who can get everything right in the first spot so maybe you put 3 to 6 months for iterating on your product and your communication to get that part right as soon as you do that and you slowly start scaling your paid acquisition spend crm has to kick in hand in hand otherwise <laughs> it becomes very expensive too soon so yeah awesome and and from a consumer behavior standpoint itself right like obviously a year back everything basically came to zero right like i think everything stopped one fine day yeah. and uh, you know slowly start things started picking up what do you think has changed uh, you know from pre covid to i i would dare not say post covid but the day we are in today yeah. from a behavior standpoint <laughs> what has changed and how is that impacting you know? the relevance yeah i i got called out for that uh, somewhere i said that you know post covid and they're like oh where is post covid <laughs> like okay so uh, so yes i think about, uh, just about a year back right i mean exactly pretty much a year back when things shut down um i think it was a great leveler right i mean businesses across you know the spectrum they just shut down the uh, i think different companies and businesses had a different split of online to offline those with purely offline it was far more brutal for them i would i would i would think that because offline it doesn't matter if there, there is a supply and a demand even if supply opens up that okay malls are open shops are open there has to be demand i mean the customer has to feel comfortable and safe to go to a store and back there in july even before july july say may june july nobody had any clue about you know when the vaccine would come and what would happen so a lot of customers who were selling online first they saw a massive spike in june and even a bigger spike in Ju- july i remember once uh, end of may when when you know it eased up of course essentials were on but a lot of businesses like ours was in the non essentials bucket but there was this displaced demand that we saw and by i mean we were debating as to why is there a spike why is the cac suddenly one fourth of what we used to spend earlier it was it was because there were a lot of people who typically don't shop online they were now being forced to shop online because i mean you can't have, there were no stores open so i mean the amount of like customers we acquired in those 3 months of june july and august it was insane it was like suddenly a gold rush so it was like okay chalo you know end of march april may we we paid a price but now we are like making up for it more than that so we were fortunate but uh, retail took a long while uh, it's also depending on the split of the retail business see for us the retail happens in two different parts one is the general trade which is the ubiquitous mom and pop stores the general kirana stores or the whole series stores and the other is the large format retailers in malls and our own stores now malls whether a mall will reopen or not we felt that it was very tactical in nature the discussions were political there were rent concessions being sought by a lot of brands including us so a lot of times because of that there was a lot of friction to opening those stores general trade was beautiful because see in general trade every store owner is an entrepreneur who has to earn their living by opening the store so they were like straight up the bat you know july they started opening the store so I, you know i think now of course in you know, for a lot of industries we are back to more than 100% but um, for us and for a lot of other companies who have a significant online presence july was the part where we knew that okay we are back on track and uh, a lot of businesses are very seasonal ours beauty personal care is seasonal because the whole um, q3 october november december we see a lot of uh, uh, promotions during you know dashera karwa chauth uh, durga puja uh, diwali we were very anxious that we would miss that because that provides a huge part of our overall um, you know year's turnover but fortunately we did not so 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 yeah lucky it could have been worse 
Got it. And and you made an interesting point about you being a digital first brand now and not just the D2C. And there's this notion increasingly that D2C is just, you know, purely online, online only selling and all of that. But you've gone the other way. Yeah. You've got stores and stores, you've got exclusive stores. How does this entire uh, right, right. play out between offline, online and the consumer walkover between offline to online per se? So, see, you know, yes, I think D2C is the slightly the flavor of the season, slightly. I mean, there are, of course, right. like mind-blowing companies like like, like Wakefit. I, I look at what Chaitanya has built. I'm like, wow. <laughs> so, but there are a lot of companies. Uh, see, D2C is different. A D2C company need not technically raise funding or even scale. There are so many companies who are selling on Amazon, maybe a little bit on their website, who are making decent revenues. I mean, they're building a, uh, you know, they're, they're living their entrepreneurial dream. It's fine. But D2C is being talked about now because a lot of funds and investors are beginning to talk about D2C. So, uh, you know, internally, we changed our mindset uh, somewhere in the middle, wherein we said D2C is, I mean, why should we be so fixated about whether we are a D2C brand or a digital brand? But the point is, we are building a brand. That, see, first, above everything else, we are building a brand. Brand can be digital, we are a digital first brand, D2C brand, that's fine. But if you are building a brand, then it is our responsibility to go and reach the customer wherever the customer is. So once we agreed to that as a company, and, and the second thing was, there were two other things. One was the Indian market is super skewed. I mean, the, the, the total of the total trade, retail trade that shopping that happens, about six to seven percent, I mean, the number keeps fluctuating, but less than 10 percent for sure, six percent Manlo happens online, which means the rest of all the shopping that's happening is happening in those stores, which I told you about, right? Now, if I want to build a big brand and a big business, I can't bat for 10 overs in a 50 over match and score more than my competitor who's batting all 50 overs. So when we realized that, we were like, you know, I mean, it's not a choice. We have to play that game. I mean, we had no idea about the game. I mean, we used to go into stores and get shooed out saying that, kya kaun sa brand hai? Aap digital brand ho. Nee, 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 nee. But uh, it, it took a while. But I think when they see customers coming back for a repeat purchase, um, the barrier started, you know, moving away. Some of our large format retailers, Lifestyle was the first one to give us a chance in a pilot um, five of their stores back in 2019. And bit by bit, it it, it came through. And, and see, if I were to be very blunt about it, if you consider there are two worlds, like digital and retail, and retail it's not that, 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 that the retail players are leaving digital, right? I mean, they are also now selling equally or more on uh, the Nikes and Amazon. So we have an advantage over there because we started, we were born digital, so to say. But if those brands are playing here, then we have to play there. I mean, the, uh, otherwise, we're just going to get obliterated over a period of time. So I think that was the uh, mindset shift. And, and you know, frankly, yes, right now, when we say D2C, we actually don't consider only our website, even our own EBOs, our own brand outlets. We have over 40 of them, stores and kiosks missed. Technically, that's direct to customer because there is no commission we pay to a third party. We pay rent, of course, but but we directly engage with the customer. We have our loyalty program, which is tuned into the customer. So um, I think that's the way forward. I mean, there's a difference between the first two years of a brand and say the next five years of a brand. We are in that phase wherein we are also changing how we look at the overall market and the business. Got it. Awesome. And I have a few more questions, but probably let's uh, take a couple of audience questions at this point. Yeah. Very I, I saw. Yeah. Yeah. Vikas has a question. <laughs> Get some business secrets from you and put you in trouble. Looks like, but uh, let's start with Vikas question on uh, what's your typical cost of sales as a percentage of GMV for a new range or a sub brand at a high level. So because the cost of sales is going to be high and I mean, how do we understand cost of sales? I, I, I typically used to go through what say a Unilever balance sheet looks like and say how much are they spending? It, it was silly because at their scale, they would spend very little maybe and it would be a very large amount, but personally, it would be very little. For us, it's high. I mean, the let's say on Amazon, our goal is to reach a say maybe a 10, 15% A cost, which is average cost of sales. When we, and when we launch something and build traction, it can be as high as 50%. Then we have to optimize it and take it down to 30, then 20. And till now, very few products of ours have less than 20 average cost of sales. So that has to get built into your PNL. So similar, similar across, like on our, on our D2C channel, since this is, I mean, the D2C context, like if your average selling price is 1200 or so, you, I mean, I mean, there is a chance that you may not break even in your first sale. That is the reason why you have, uh, you know, the the ways to calculate lifetime value of a customer, 
and uh, then you end up amortizing your acquisition cost or cost of sales as you say across a period of time so you know uh, our typical would be you know far higher than what you would expect from a, from from the larger fmcg players there is a question anisha asked what's the best selling product in the sugar universe anisha that has actually changed over a period of time and i'll tell you why when we started we are still primarily known for lipsticks um it, there was no brand other than mac who had a very high i mean who owned that category but their price point was too high so over a period of time the share of lipsticks that we used to sell i mean in in the industry of, say out of lips eyes nails face these four sub categories within makeup lips typically for an industry has about say maybe 30 and 40% we used to operate at 67% lips which was pre covid um let's say 2019 mid 2019 ish our range was also a little skewed now so that time there were there's a um, uh, matte lipstick called scarlet or hara red that used to sell a lot and there's a reason for that because um it was a blue tone red which suited the indian uh, skin tone very well uh there's a there's a range called smudge me not for a while that used to be the best selling product because it used to last for a insanely long time some people used to feel that it was a tad tough to remove as well but mostly the uh, like 30 plus those who are uh, like very young 18 to 24 looking for maximum pigmentation for the for every rupee they spend on the product this was a massive hit with them today if you ask me it's different we have a over the last one we've expanded our face range and one of the contour palettes that is now like there are two variants that is now number one number two we are also uh, surprised but pleasantly surprised because for a while um, we were happy about being a i mean we want to be a beauty brand not a lipstick only brand we are proud of the lipsticks we make but we were always uh, unsure whether the customer would scale their love and affinity for us beyond lipstick we are seeing that happen now got it uh, i think follow up question on uh, split between on site marketplace and general trade i think you mentioned 50 50 but anything you want to elaborate uh, yeah yeah so so retail retail and online for us is now 50 50 uh, although we i mean the market is some 90 10 or or worse so i think uh, as we grow as a brand it will be tough to hold on to 50 50 but i still think we would try to hold on to maybe 30 65 or something like that in favor of online even that will be huge even that will be huge yeah. and uh, yeah uh, on site and marketplace is also an even split half and half got it anisha also uh, has a follow up question on marketing channels a new player should put money in and i think there's a similar question on one piece of advice to acquire more customers so is there like that one mantra which which will solve all problems you know if i believe there's a mantra but even if there's a mantra i know not believe that i'm not qualified to give any mantra so <laughs> i'll just tell you what we did uh, so so i see it is okay how do we acquire customers we pick a banner or a text ad and then we you know spend money showing it to people which is building impressions on instagram google search display and other channels now everybody can do that right and the point is then where do you stop today you put up a banner which says um, hey flat 10% off somebody your competitor says hey flat 20% off and you're wondering oh <laughs> now it's not going to convert anymore so beyond the point i i i think that you know you should earmark a certain amount and just stick to the amount and that amount can be anything it can be 5000 per day it can be 50000 per day doesn't matter it may be 5 lakh per day it doesn't matter but but that is the amount which you can spend towards uh, let's say push advertising which is you know sending out your message that hey this is a there's a sale going on or there's an offer going on um, what is the hook right i mean for a long while we uh, never spoke about any of our offers we used to just say hey new launch and for a while it worked for till till uh, you know this is very interesting there's a constant Uh, thought we had that how do we get customers to come back to our website and it is expensive to get a com- customer to come back to our website so one of the hacks and this is a hack yes now it may not work but one of the hacks between 2016 17 18 we did was where the industry would launch a product or range say maybe once in two months or three months we had a once a month launch or a even double sometimes including products and ranges twice a month launch so our customers almost got used to that cadence wherein once a month we would get a once or twice a month they would get a communication from us saying that hey guys new launch um, you know check out the swatches and they would click on that and come back to our website now everybody has figured out faster production and go to market cycles but that time it was brilliant for I mean we used to continue to get that incoming traffic just by launching new things and we used to spend money you know publicizing that 
today if you ask me the what is the one thing you should do i think invest in channels where uh, you know, you know demarcate your selling and telling channels i mean there is there are channels which you sell and you say okay i'm going to spend 10000 rupees a day or 5000 rupees a day whatever the amount is uh, i mean i'm assuming we are just starting up hence i'm using uh, subdued numbers uh, to sell which means you say okay on this range x percent of this scheme that scheme because that's the unfortunately the internet internet is gravitated to a point wherein you need a just a story isn't enough you need a click call to action right wherein you click uh, and say that okay this is a time sensitive expiring benefit and offer i can get but the one advice i would give is spend an equal amount on content i i I, I'm a I'm a big believer in content because content has really really helped us in standing out amongst a lot of our lot of our you know you know peers. I mean, about two and a half years back, we decided that okay, Instagram was the channel where we were getting most engagement. We have to have to make it big. And you know, last December we crossed a million followers. We are I think currently at one point two, one point one, high one point one ish. It continues to amaze because there, I mean, there's such an engaged community and the product. I mean, you know how nimble the product is. वो कहीं पे भी कुछ feature है वो copy करके लगा देंगे वहाँ पे तो the product is going to keep evolving and customers are going to continue to engage, right? So we bet big on Instagram and uh, it drives a lot of top of the funnel awareness. Uh, also, click throughs for our website. YouTube is the next channel which we are trying to crack. Uh, we recently touched two hundred thousand subscribers. That we, I mean, the team has to now <laughs> build the journey too. So, so this thing, these numbers may seem big, but I want to share something. The Instagram handle of ours was created in twenty sixteen March. Mm-hmm. We hit with zero, right? Of course, we hit hundred thousand subscribers in December twenty eighteen. We hit three hundred thousand subscribers in December twenty nineteen. and we hit 1 million in december 2020 sorry 20 yeah 2020 so you know there is a certain amount of you know uh, doing the grunt work that has to happen before compounding kicks in but once compounding kicks in it is it is jam it is beautiful so i i really think day one say if you start taking content like treating content saying that ha huh, i need to spend some amount in creating some content it leaves a you know a hansel gretel type it leaves a trail of crumbs so that someday when brands discover you and search for your brand they see not recent content they see teen saal ka content that, oh my god these guys have been uh, sharing the story forever maybe i was the one who was living under a rock and they they really engage they really engage so um yeah so and that's a great point about content i guess it's a long game but something which is very sustainable and keeps giving uh, results over a long period of time right Uh, I think so. I think. So. Yeah, I think couple of more questions. Uh, so let's take Rudro's question, uh, which is more around typical time frame to ideate a product to launch and doing course corrections and essentially, I guess, product market fit. Is there a time frame for it? Whatever it is in your Excel sheet right now, it's actually faster than that because <laughs> because when we see, okay, I'll tell you our experience when we start. and no nothing right what do we do we ask people in the industry by batao kitna time lagta hai to go to market and create a product and whatever we hear from them we try to build our excel sheet as per that but when you do it yourself you know and and i'm assuming that when you do it yourself you're like there's a certain sense of urgency you bring into everything right you suddenly realize that are this can be done much faster i mean from the uh, container design to to fixing the actual product uh, getting it shipped i mean it's very industry specific of course but if you look at our category you can there are people who develop products in 3 weeks and of course if you're getting it from abroad it may end up taking 2 months or so but that is fast compared to what brands used to be able to do 2 uh, years or you know maybe 10 years back so that's an advantage the second part of your question i found it i find it more interesting rudra because when we create a product see like 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 See the artist who created this painting. Okay, up to my mind, something was made. That okay, this is what I think is beautiful, which is what we also do. We do our research and we do say that okay, this packaging, this is perfect. Now, when we launch today, after so many launches across four years, five years, we have a benchmark and say, this category, me, the first ninety days on our own website should clock this much sales. If they don't clock this much sales, we have a tolerance of say maybe twenty percent, wherein we say we can fix it. if it falls below 20% of that like it, then a team meeting has to happen ki okay is it worth fixing this product or we just you know quietly take the product off because i mean 
what's the point in investing a, in a product that's not going to win and it has it has happened i mean sometimes the, the I, i think the problem is us because we spend so much of our effort and you know living breathing time fantasizing about it's a product launch hoga it's going to kill it it's tough to shelve a product and we we didn't do that for a long while but there's a time when you realize that it's blocking working capital you can free up the working capital to actually invest in new range promotions and expanding new ranges then we decided to be a bit more uh, clinical about it but um, but have a I, i would say have a benchmark which only you can decide because you know your industry best ki after i launch it it should hit this much sales in the first 90 days or if you want a shorter scale then put a 30 day marker maybe actually you know what 30 day marker is better because 90 days mein to kitne products launch ho jate so you put a 30 day marker and then you know okay, okay these are the people who have purchased if something's off i have the data of the customers so i can call them to actually ask them you know why they didn't like what they didn't like that really we have a separate team that does that you know just just call the customer after the initial reviews are in to understand where we are go wrong the only problem is most people who purchase in the first month are people who already trust the brand so when we call them they we need to dig a lot for them to actually tell why, what they did not like about the product but uh, but that's fine we still sometimes end up getting really really powerful insights so very ruthless about data driven product launches in that case then mm-hmm. try to be yeah. I, i i try to use the word clinical not ruthless but yeah <laughs> better way to put it uh, a very interesting question from hamida on uh, uh i i know you started off with subscription models at some point uh, yes 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 talk, yes talk a bit on that is that a good way to build repeat so question, but yeah so our subscription business uh, was and is uh, fabbag so fabbag ha- initially had nothing to do with sugar it was a beauty subscription service um which started on the lines of a new way to purchase uh, products which picked up popularity abroad there was glossy box birch box cc and uh, we really thought that you know india would benefit from it because it was tough to get access to beauty products uh, back in 2012 when we started of course i mean nike solved for all of that but uh, but that was not the only reason why that didn't scale beyond the point the the challenge was when like anything like hamid to answer your question directly anything which you try to build a subscription engine around it right the first question we solve we ask is are we solving for supply or demand in most cases as a as a person who is making it we are very biased towards solving for supply that acha if i have to give a person this thing once every month where do i get it from the the question to ask is does the person need it every month like let, let's say milk i i have a milk subscription which comes outside my door every day super daily wonderful people the point is if i finish today's milk then tomorrow's milk is very useful and god sent for me if i don't finish today's milk tomorrow's milk is a headache for me it's going to get spoiled but the same thing happens with a lot of subscription models when i when when we did subscription we realized that after four months of back to back sending products the customer there was some product fatigue built in that they are not consuming products as fast as we are sending them and then the model you know th- then churn happens the customer grows out so subscription is a good way to repeat purchases i have very very few examples i can't think of examples of physical goods that uh, you know apart from daily consumables uh, like say as the, the milk example which i gave which have actually managed to crack um, subscription like for example you often hear like subscribe and save on amazon wherein there's a you know maybe a colossal kajal wherein they put an estimate that, okay 3 months mein khatam ho jayega so after 3 months can i give everything you know the okay let's why should you subscribe for a price benefit there is there are enough platforms giving you deep discounts price benefit flash sales uh, so that as and when you decide to want the product you can get a good price so price benefit is not there in subscription so what is there is it the fact that you will not remember to buy it if you don't remember to buy it, then it's not that important for you is what i feel so i i don't think in india uh, maybe maybe i'm missing something but i've not seen any d2c brand or any 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 product brand really really uh, do a good job of building a subscription based uh, business line um there's one question about content strategy i think content strategy you know just to summarize it there was a day when we decided that instagram has to be photographed not designed like if you ask your design team to make instagram content what you will get is ad banners which you put on Inst- put 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 on put on Google search Google display that doesn't work that doesn't work beyond one because if people see enough of that on 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 their content sites I mean Instagram they come for inspiration right it's very tough to inspire with design photography 
helps you tell a story with a good caption. I think that's what we decided two years back that, you know, we're going to stop designing band Instagram posts. We're going to start photographing them. You know, I mean, instead of showing our products, show our product on people that what can you create with those products? You know, a bit of the Apple, uh, you know, marketing study that, you know, don't show the product, show what people can create with the product. And in our category, that works very well because there are some extremely talented people who create such amazing looks with the products we have. So that has helped us. Um, that has helped us shape our content. Yes, I don't know how we're doing on time. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking. <laughs> slightly over time. So we'll probably, uh, you know, take the rest of the questions offline, Kaushik. Uh, but this has been really no worries. great conversation. I think very engaging as well. A lot of people really love your storytelling as well, as you can see from the chat. Uh, but, but thank you so much for doing this.